You've just put a ton of work, time, and money into your new car audio system. But when you crank up the bass, there's nothing there. Any number of things could have gone wrong. You need to check your crossovers, your gains, and all of the settings on your radio. And after you've done all that, you might need to actually look at the signal that your radio is sending out to your amplifiers. This is especially important if you're retaining your factory radio and using a line output converter to connect to your amplifier. Many factory head units filter out the bass in order to prevent damage to the factory speakers. Now I've been told for years that the solution to that problem is to use a device like this. This is a bass restoration processor. And to be perfectly honest, I always assumed that these things were just a bunch of hocus pocus and marketing BS. I mean, come on, how can you actually add bass that didn't exist in the first place? That doesn't sound possible to me. Perhaps all these things are just bass boost controllers. Then NVX reached out to me and said, hey, we think you ought to give one of these things a try. That's exactly what we're gonna do in this video. We're gonna put this thing to the test and find out exactly what it does. And if you've watched my channel, you know that I'm not a big fan of bass boost. While I'm cracking open the box, full disclosure, NVX is a channel sponsor. If you're looking for car audio, you can head over to nvx.com and use the code DIYAudio15 for a discount. Now, even though NVX is sponsoring this video, my goal is to provide as unbiased of a review as I possibly can. And what I'm gonna do is simply measure the output from this device. And the measurement is the measurement. This is no different than when someone does an amp dyno. We're gonna see the information on the screen and then we'll know exactly what's going on. There's no way to put my finger on the scale. This thing is either going to enhance bass or it's not. The very first thing that I noticed when I unboxed it was the size. This thing is really small. Here it is next to my cell phone. It's not that much bigger than this phone. We're gonna plug this thing into an RTA and see exactly what this device does. So keep watching. Before we do that, let's look at some of the other features. This thing has several tools on it that are designed specifically to help with integrating into a factory radio. To start off with, it has these high level inputs on this side that just plug in with one of these connectors here. I think it's called a Phoenix connector. And then right beside that plug, there is a load select switch where you can pick three different levels of resistance. Some newer cars will actually look for resistance on the speaker wires. And if there's no resistance there, they're going to assume that something's gone wrong and the radio will just completely shut down and not play. And this switch right here lets you pick between three different resistance levels so that you can trick your factory radio into thinking that the speakers are hooked up and everything's operating normally. Another big challenge when integrating with a factory radio is figuring out a way to get your amplifiers to turn on. So the XBBR2 has three selectable turn on modes. There's the signal sense that's gonna look for music coming into the device. There's the DC offset, which looks for a DC current that a lot of factory head units will run out to speakers. And then finally, there is the remote switch where you can use a remote turn on just like you would if you had an aftermarket head unit powering up your amplifiers. And right here on the power plug, it has a remote in and a remote out. So however you get the device to turn on, it can then send a remote out signal to your amplifiers and this device can turn on your amplifier. The unit also has a ground isolator mode. If you have a ground loop, you're gonna get alternator wine and that switch right there is designed to combat that problem. Down at the bottom right of the unit, you've got some RCA outputs, a gain control and a clip light. And that gain control exists independently of the effects on the device. The level of the effects on the device are actually controlled by the knob. The other side does have RCA inputs, so you could use this with an aftermarket radio. Now, since I am a little bit of a doubting Thomas and I like to see evidence and proof before I'm convinced of things, I jumped online, did a little bit of research about bass restoration processors. These things really have been around for a long time and there is a company that patented a bass restoration processor way back in the mid 1980s, 85, 86, something like that. And if you know anything about patents, you know they do expire after 20 years. And when you file a patent, all the information in the patent becomes public knowledge. Anyone can go look up a patent. And then a knowledgeable person can take that information and recreate whatever thing was invented after the patent expired. I'm not an expert on patent law and I'm not an engineer, so I can't verify that this device uses the exact same patented technology. I did read through the patent and was able to 
decipher some of the non-technical stuff. Now I've got a better understanding of how a bass restoration processor can create bass. Basically what happens is the signal comes into the device and is split into two parts. One of those parts is going to be sent right to the outputs untouched and the other part is going to go through a set of filters. Filters are going to filter out all of the high frequency information so that all that's left is the bass, things like the thump of a kick drum. And that kick drum will have a fundamental frequency. That's the main frequency that's being played when you bang on the drum. Plus it'll have harmonics. And that bass processor filters out everything except for the low frequency information, observes that low frequency information, adds a subharmonic, and sends that subharmonic back into the musical signal and through the outputs. In theory, that's what it's supposed to do. Let's find out. Let's measure this thing and see what it actually does. So what I've got here is an old cell phone. It has a headphone jack. I'm gonna take a 3.5 millimeter patch cable and connect it to the headphone jack and then connect it right into the headphone jack of another old cell phone. And now just going cell phone to cell phone, not going through the NVX X BBR2, we're gonna play some test tones. Here's 100 hertz, here's 80 hertz, and here is 60 hertz. And you can clearly see the peak in the frequency. Up here at the top of the screen, the RTA is going to point out the loudest frequency. And my DIY RTA setup doesn't appear to be the most accurate, but we are still able to see the test tones clear enough in order to run this experiment. One day I hope to upgrade from my DIY RTA to a quality professional RTA unit so that I can make better videos for you, which is one reason why I ask for your support over on Patreon. The financial support I receive from my patrons gives me the opportunity to upgrade my test equipment and make better videos for all of you. So I want to say thank you to all of my patrons with a special shout out to Dylan, Bo, and Baba. Now we're going to switch things up a little bit and go ahead and connect the XBBR2 and run the same test tones. So now let's play 100 Hertz. And you can see right here with your own eyes, plain as day, there is a bump in the output down around 50 hertz. When we turn up the knob to increase the effect level, clearly plain as day, we can see we have added bass that wasn't there before. Same thing for the 80 hertz tone. We see a bump in output about an octave below the frequency that we're playing. And here's a 60 hertz test tone. And when we turn up the knob, we get bass down at 30 hertz. And as I turn up the knob, take a look at the bottom of the screen. Look at what's going on down there. There's an oscilloscope down here. And as we turn the knob up, we move from the nice clean waveform we typically expect to see to this kind of wonky twisted waveform. We're going to talk more about that in just a little bit. So keep watching. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and play some lab grade pink noise. And I've adjusted the RTA to zoom into everything from 500 Hertz down, just so it's easier to see what's going on. What I want you to notice is that this pink noise, it's just static is about 10 dB louder at 250 Hertz versus 30 Hertz. I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's the output of the cell phone. I don't know if it's the music itself that I'm playing. Air quotes, because it's not music. It's just static, it's pink noise. But I am going to just turn up that bass knob and see what happens and lo and behold, the low frequencies come back in. We've got our bass back. Now I have the sweep and the wide control set all the way to the left. The sweep control controls the center frequency of a parametric equalizer and the wide control does exactly what it says it does. It controls how wide the EQ is. As the wide control goes up, more frequencies get boosted. As it goes down, fewer frequencies get boosted. It looks like we're peaking somewhere in the 40 to 50 hertz range. And then it slopes off as we go up the frequency band. Things look to be back to normal at about 125 hertz. What you'll notice this down in the 20 to 30 hertz range is that the levels are about as high as they are up in the 250 hertz range. The end user doesn't have any control over the frequencies that get added back in. The processor takes care of all of that. You have control over the three parts of the parametric equalizer, the sweep control, the wide control, and the level control in the form of the base knob. This knob is not a gain knob. The gain on the device is a separate control from the parametric equalizer. For this test right here, I've got the level control cranked all the way up and the sweep and the wide are all the way to the left. So we're at the lowest frequency and the narrowest bandwidth. I'm gonna turn the sweep all the way to the right. Let's see what happened. And we can see that the low end has dropped off and the peak frequency 
frequency has shifted to the right higher up in the frequency spectrum. Now let's see what happens if I take the wide knob and turn it all the way to the right for the widest possible setting. And you can see that the low frequencies that we lost when we changed the sweep have now come back. Plus we've got a little bit more output up closer to 100 hertz or so. And again, trailing off at about 125. Now there are a couple other factors to consider before you decide if you need to buy one of these. And we'll get to those in just a second, but for now we have something really important. We've got actual proof that this device does add bass back in. And that single band parametric equalizer gives you a great deal of control. Now I know from the statistics that YouTube gives me that a lot of you watch other audio people on YouTube like Steve Mead. And you know Steve Mead's been testing out line output converters trying to show which ones are dirty and which ones are clean. So while we've got it here we might want to test it and see if it puts out a clean signal and verify the accuracy of the clip light. So now here's what we're going to do. We're going to take one of my favorite tools, my trusty oscilloscope. Everybody needs to have one of these oscilloscopes. They've gotten so cheap that if you're into audio at all you should probably go ahead and pick one up. We're going to use the scope to measure the output coming from the cell phone to verify that we've got a clean signal going into the XBBR2. I've tested this cell phone out numerous times. Here we are at full volume, nice clean waveform, no clipping at all. Now that we've verified that, I'm going to move the oscilloscope to the output side and we're going to see what the waveform looks like coming out the other end. Now there are two output channels right and left, so I've got the oscilloscope on one channel and the DD1 Plus on the other. We're going to turn up the gain until we get clipping and see if the clip light is accurate. As we crank up the game, we can see that the clip light on the XBBR2 lights up just a hair before the distortion detector on the DD1+. So the clip light on this thing is perfectly fine and accurate. Hey, let's look at the waveform on the oscilloscope. It's not smooth and clean. It's kind of funky. There's this extra wave that's been added into it. And as you crank the effect level up, it gets even more extreme. All right, what the heck is going on here? Well, technically speaking, what we're observing is distortion. Why did the DD1 Plus not pick that up. The DD1 looks at the higher frequency harmonics when it's looking for distortion. It doesn't look at the low frequency harmonics. So the distortion we see in this device is going to get ignored by the DD1. Now I'm not sure if that was planned or if it just turns out to be a happy accident because ignoring this distortion is the right thing to do. This is distortion in the same sense that an electric guitar is a distorted acoustic guitar. And turning up the effect knob on this device is the equivalent to turning up the effect knob on one of those foot pedals that guitar players use. Now the device is marketed specifically for someone who is trying to restore bass that was removed by a factory radio. But now that I've got my hands on it and I've tested it, I know what it does and I better understand the technology, I can actually see a few more uses for a device like this. For example, it is well known that sealed subwoofers don't play as low as ported subwoofers. And the common solution to that problem is a little thing called a Linkwitz transformation. Basically it's using DSP and EQ in crossovers in order to boost the really low frequencies those frequencies that a sealed enclosure struggles to play. And a lot of sound quality people will tell you that this is the best way to go. You get your tight punchy bass from your sealed enclosure and you get your low frequency extension. In order to do that right, you really need a really expensive digital signal processor. But this thing right here with that parametric equalizer can really do a lot of the same things. It's definitely the kind of device that if you need it, you really need it. And the only way to know for sure that you need it is to actually measure the output from that factory radio. For that, I recommend an RTA. And of course, RTAs can be extremely expensive, which is why I built my DIY RTA. If you'd like to see how to build your own DIY RTA, click on this video right here. To learn more about sealed subwoofers and the science behind them, click on this video right here. I'm Justin. This is the DIY Audio Guy YouTube channel. Click right over here to subscribe.